Okay, in this video recording, I want to go over the second case that you were supposed to read uh, for week two. And what I'm trying to do here is give you a clearer concept of the different ways of looking at a legal case uh, from outside. So um, kind of help you see how there's different positions, right? Whether you're a student of law, professor of law, legal scholar, lawyer, judge, um, citizen, resident, right? Different ways of thinking about this case. Um, and I also wanted to see how, I wanted you to see how, although there's nine Supreme Court justices, it's very rare that you'll get what's called a unanimous case where all nine justices agree with the outcome. Uh, so I'm going to show you the difference between the majority, and this case is actually a plurality opinion because there's so many different opinions on this case. Um, but that the binding case is called the plurality case here, uh, and that's written by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, whereas the dissent is written by Antonin Scalia with Justice Stevens, and that helps you understand the, the argument that's going on within the court itself, which is then part of the larger political and legal argument. This is all to kind of help you understand throughout this course that law is not one thing, uh, and it's not agreed upon. Uh, by all people. So I want to start just by, you know, what, what do I do, right? So I have kind of two roles here. Uh, on the one hand, I'm a law professor and then I'm a legal scholar. So I'll talk about the law professor part first uh, to help you kind of see where we're going with this. Um, so my job, right, to help students go through this class and through this process uh, is to try to provide a clear context of legal cases. Uh, you're reading legal cases in this class, uh, but as I'm sure you'll find out as you go through it, you know it, it's you don't understand all the details uh, just simply by reading a case. There's the social environment, there's the political environment, there's history, there's biography, there's all these different aspects of a case. It's not just as simple as reading. Uh, the other issue is that there's a lot of vocabulary. So I'm breaking down the context and guiding you through the process so that you get a better idea of what, what does this vocabulary mean uh, and how is it used and largely how is it used differently uh, than it would be in your other classes, uh, something that even other professors have a hard time understanding. And then hopefully we're going to get to a point where, where you are analyzing critically, um, where you're not just reading the case and saying, oh, okay, I get it, I understand, and that must be the way the world works. Uh, no, I want you to be able to have opinions um, and informed opinions uh, about did you think this was the right outcome? Uh, what were the consequences of that outcome? And what were the social factors that led to this, this decision? And to do this, you really have to start to separate the ideals from what's going on on the ground. So, you know, this is simply, you know, stated or kind of how my grandma would have put it. Um, you know, if, if there were just ideals, if everybody just behaved, right, and did everything perfectly, uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't need law. We wouldn't need rules. We wouldn't need punishment, right? We wouldn't need all these things. Um, and so a lot of times you'll see in a textbook they're talking about the ideals of democracy or the ideals of law uh, or legal practice. And, and that's not realistic. That's not what really actually happens on the ground. So you know, we're not throwing away the ideals. The ideals are there, they exist, right? People have written about them. Um, but we don't want to get confused and think that's what really happens. Uh, and so we want to think about what's going on in that separation or in that gap. And this is to help us provoke thoughts about principles. You know, what, how should we change the ideals? Maybe the ideals don't really apply anymore. And whose ideals, right? A lot of the ideals you see in textbook were of a very particular group of people uh, from the 1600s. Uh, largely from England, and so that's not universal, right? Not everybody believes in those principles. Now, the other issue here is how does a judge see law? Well, you know, in this case in particular, right, this is the way that Justice O'Connor sees the laws in the case that come in, and she frames the issue as to consider the legality of the government's detention of a United States citizen, and we'll stop there for a second, right? So. She's saying, was this act of detaining this man, Hamdi, which in this picture you're seeing he's being detained by uh, another Afghan, um, I, I should say, right, that actually by an Afghanistan um, Northern Alliance 
troop, right, which was the creation of the United States. Uh, the question really is not is Hamdi a United States citizen? He is, right? So, but he's a United States citizen in Afghanistan during a time of war, and that's where the trouble starts, right? Um, his father says it's, you know, bad luck. He went there on a, a service mission, and he's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Many of us could say the same thing about times we've been in trouble, right? We were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and so she frames it, you know, is it legal for the United States government to detain somebody based on this principle? You're at the wrong, you know, wrong place, wrong time. And can you continue to detain that person once they're on United States soil? Are there different rules that apply? And then is this label, which is a new label, enemy combatant, uh, how does that apply to this detention? And then finally, you know, we have to talk about what's the constitutional process owed to people uh, in this situation, uh, especially in regards to how they challenge the situation. So, you know, probably many of you are either too young or, or, or weren't really paying attention um, in 2004. Uh, but you know th this is this argument that O'Connor is making from a legal point of view is very different than the social political argument that I was hearing around me uh, when I was in college uh, and from family and friends. And so from the very beginning, judges see laws outside of that social and political context. Now that's kind of silly, right? Because they're still in the social political context. But here she's just trying to frame it in the narrowest possible way. And that's really the most important part of understanding Supreme Court cases. They're not trying to solve social problems. They're trying to solve legal problems, problems that are rising up in the legal community. And so this, judges do not determine the truth or scientific basis of an assertion. They're not logical philosophers. Uh, they are not scientists. <laughs> They don't tr retry a case before a jury of peers. So, you know, students are often confused about this. You know, juries are at the lowest court. The Supreme Court doesn't have a jury. They don't hear cases. Uh, they don't try facts. They're simply looking at what are called errors of law. And that's all they're looking at uh, is, was there an error somewhere in this legal process? And then they don't form opinions as to which side is more trustworthy. They don't think about, well, this is what the Democrats say, this is what the Republicans say, this is what the independents say. Uh, that's not what they're trying to do. So they're not resolving political debates. I say that because if you turn on you know, TV news right now when they report Supreme Court cases, they act as if this is what judges do, that a Supreme Court case decided this is how the country feels about such and such thing. This is not even close to being reality. So how did we get here, right, to this case with Hamdi? Well, if you look on page three of the, of the case, Hamdi's father files something called a petition for the writ of habeas corpus. Now, this is a strange phrase, um, but it's in constitutional law in Article One, Section 9. So th that's the first basis. I can bring that writ, and a writ is like a demand. It's, a piece, it's literally a piece of paper. Uh, now, of course, you do it on the computer. Um, you could still do it in the paper form if you wanted, I'm sure. Um, but this is based in the Constitution. Well, it's also got something called positive law, meaning the legislature, Congress, has also passed an act where they talk about the writ of habeas corpus. Um, and this is the habit and the custom of judges. Judges have used this concept of, of habeas corpus for hundreds of years uh, without the Constitution, without the Congress. Uh, and that's because it came from something called the common law uh, in the Magna Carta. And that's this picture you're seeing here where the barons are demanding their rights to the king. Um, and, you know, this is 800 years old by now. And this comes from this principle that's even older than that. It's over a thousand years, which is called liberty. And it's a principle of natural law, meaning I can look out in nature and I can see that people are free. And so the, this concept of being able to challenge authority, to be able to challenge the people who are detaining you, is an ancient concept. Uh, and it largely stems from what is known as Anglo-Saxon tradition, as we're going to see in Scalia. This does not mean that other cultures or other parts of the world don't have this concept. What it means is that within the American legal system, this is the tradition or the custom of habit 
uh, that it has followed from this point of, view, of view. So then what do lawyers do within this process of habeas corpus? Well, I think the thing I wanted to really show you here is that this is Hamdi versus Rumsfeld. So this man here is Rumsfeld. He's a former congressman, uh, long, long political career, almost became president in the 80s. Um, and then he became the Secretary of Defense. Um, he's well known, I guess, in certain circles for being combative with media personnel, but he was very instrumental in changing the United States military, uh, especially after the World Trade Center and Pentagon attacks. And he, he was a, an interesting figure, I'll leave it that way. There's, there's documentaries you can watch about him uh, if you want to know more. He's a problematic person. Um, but the lawyers for the state, for the United States government, essentially are defending Rumsfeld in this case. And Rumsfeld is a representative of the United States military, and that's who's detained uh, Hamdi. And so now we have a bunch of agencies that are involved. So you have the Department of Defense, you have the Executive Department, which includes the President, and then you have a bunch of bureaucratic professionals uh, in the State Department and the Justice Departments. And, you know, the point here is that these departments are very large, and so everybody doesn't necessarily agree with each other. Uh, probably more, you know, the majority of the people in the states and the Justice Department did agree at the time. They might have changed their minds over time, but at the time they did agree that, that somebody captured in what's called the field of battle uh, should be held uh, at least for a certain period of time, and then some said indefinitely. And that's really the issue, is that if, if these folks for the government are saying that Hamdi should be held forever, but on the other hand, there's an ancient tradition within the legal community of the writ of habeas corpus to challenge that detention, that's what O'Connor is really dealt with here and the Supreme Court is trying to figure out. So these lawyers, what they're supposed to do is find an exception to the common law, to the positive law, and to the constitutional law. They're saying, okay, yes, there's this tradition and ordinarily people would have this right to challenge their detention, but this is an extreme or an emergency situation in which we don't think that that should apply. And what they're gonna look for to do this is say there must be some custom or habit within the history of the United States where judges have granted an exception like this. Uh, and this is really by looking at the history of government uh, and the actors within government. So what about for the accused? What about for Hamdi? Well, so, you know, this is complicated, of course, right? But what they're going to do in general, they're going to start with the positive law. Now, why? Well, that's, that's one of those habits of court. A uh, hundred years ago, they would have started with natural law. Now, we are a society of positive law thinkers. People think that we can solve social problems through legislation. So, you know, a 16-year-old gets a semi-automatic weapon or a fully automatic weapon, shoots a bunch of people uh, at a, a movie theater. What do people say? They don't say punish the kid, right? That's, that's strange because 30 years ago, that's what they said. What they say now is enact, Congress needs to pass a law. And so they think that that's going to solve the problem. That is not the history of the United States. That's a, in the last hundred years, a thing that has developed from social services to, uh, you know, the DMV, right? There's lots of different approaches to solving problems, but Americans, at least through the courts and through the Congress, have decided that positive law is the way to go. Um, you know, you could take a lot of classes where you can analyze whether that's the case. We'll see a lot of instances in which the positive law really doesn't do much of anything. Um, and so you'll have to make your own decisions as to that. But what they're going to do is they're going to look at the positive law. They're going to look at that Congress uh, bill about habeas corpus and they're going to see what's the intent, what's the purpose, and then what are the rules of construction. And rules of construction mean how am I supposed to read this legislation? Sometimes Congress actually writes the rules of construction. Other times they don't, and so judges have to come up with those rules of construction. So they're going to try to see, well, this is why Congress intended for this bill to apply to Hamdi and people like him in this situation. Then they have to address the state's arguments from findings of law, meaning they have to look at other cases and say, 
okay, the state is arguing there's an exception here, and the exception applied in this situation, this situation, this situation. It's going to be, I'll give you a, a hint, it's going to be in former, in former uh, historical wars, right? So they're going to look at World War II, Vietnam, World War I, the Civil War, and they're going to say, okay, this person didn't get habeas corpus, and so this is like this case. So these lawyers have to say, no, 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 this case is not like this case. And so they're going to do that with what's called findings of law. Then they have to examine the methods of findings of fact. So what happened at the trial? or lack of trial or the hearing, right? What happened in that process? And was that consistent uh, with the rules of evidence, which is what uh, we'll be talking about in a second. And then finally, they have to look at maintaining the burden of proof rules. This is a bit of strategy. They have to make sure that the other side, the state's lawyers, don't successfully argue that Hamdi has to prove that he's not an enemy combatant, uh, because that's not the way the Constitution works, but the positive law provides the opportunity for that what's called burden shifting. So you can see that is already problematic within a constitutional law class. The positive law doesn't necessarily follow the constitutional law, and that's this kind of checks and balances approach that judges have to do. And so we have three sets of judges, right? On the bottom, that's the U.S. District Court. These are thought of as trial courts. So this is where that fact-finding process should occur or it's going to review a hearing in the case of, uh, uh, of the military. And so this is really where it all began, the file of the petition against the detention. This is called negative rights because something, I just is my joke, but it's a good way of remembering it, is something negative had to happen for you to have rights, right? You thought you had the right to be free from unwarranted search and seizure. Well, guess what? You got, you got searched and seized, so now you have to sue uh, and file the petition against that search and seizure. So it didn't really protect you, uh, which is why it's you know not a positive right, it's a negative right. Um, and then you go to trial court and they're gonna see like, was the detention lawful? Well, in this case, it was interesting because the district court said no, it wasn't lawful, it was illegal, but of course the state appealed and then the court of appeals, the next level, which doesn't look at the facts of the case uh, or renew the facts of the case. They just look, did the facts of the case follow the rules of evidence and did it fit within the, the findings of law? And they said it did follow the rules of evidence, but the findings of law were in error. It was uh, incorrect. So now it has to go to the Supreme Court because you have two courts disagreeing with each other now. District Court says it was illegal. U.S. Court of Appeals says no, no, it was legal. Now the Supreme Court has to figure it out. So this is the process of appellate, it's called appellate jurisdiction. Uh, and so you wanna think about this, right? A lot of cases never get past the district courts. They don't get appeals. Um, of, of the many, many, many cases that go from the district courts to the appeals, they don't actually make it to the Supreme Court. And this is, you know, another thing I'll pick on the media is they'll say something like, well, the Supreme Court uh, decided against you know such and such case but the supreme court never heard the case there's a lot of reasons why the supreme court doesn't hear a case it doesn't mean that they disagreed or agree with either of the lower courts there's only nine of them there's only so many days in a year they don't meet every day of the year and so there's only so many cases they can they can meet uh, and hear and so they're not going to hear every single appeal and so they tend to look at uh, cases that have a big influence across the entire country because as you can see here in the U.S. Court of Appeals there's 13 circuits there's 13 different regions within the United States uh, and then there's 94 districts uh, across the United States they're trying to see what are the cases that are going to affect all of these districts so some cases I mean like some cases that come out of Texas those aren't don't have any influence over what's going to happen in the West Coast the Northeast uh, in the Midwest. And so what's the point of hearing that case? It's just a problem for Texans to figure out. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's a part of the political problem uh, of the Supreme Court. So if we start at the trial one, right, the district court, what Hamdi's father, who's called a next friend because he's filing on behalf of, of Hamdi, his son, um, files this writ of habeas corpus, which means you must have the body before us for submitting, which is really, you know, this is all ancient Roman uh, language, but the idea here is, you know, you, you have this, this person, 
and now you, you must produce them. You must bring their body before this court so that we can decide what to do with the body, what to do with this person. And the basis for this claim was that Hamdi was held without legal counsel, right? So you'd say, well, that's a violation of his constitutional rights. Uh, they didn't give him notice of his charges. You know, the, what, what am I being held for, right, is what we commonly say. So again, another violation. Um, and largely, this is, falls under what's called the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments, as we'll look at this. And then even larger, the doctrine is called due process. Just remember this whole thing is illegal custody. The government or the state or the police or the FBI or the whoever you want to think about it is they are illegally holding on to you. And this is what this writ of habeas corpus is about. If you're being illegally detained, then you are supposed to bring this legal petition called a writ of habeas corpus. So what can the state argue at this point? Well, you know, again, they're just trying to find an exception to this process. Uh, and this, this falls under three categories, as you see over in the left-hand corner, criminal procedure, evidence, and forensics. So I want to point out, forensics may not be what you thought it meant. Uh, forensic science, right, is a part of forensics. And so sometimes forensic scientists are used as expert witnesses uh, in the rules of evidence to put evidence into a case. But you don't have to be a forensic scientist to be an expert witness in a trial. In fact, most of the experts in forensics are not scientists. Uh, they might have PhDs, they might have law degrees, they might have a variety of things. In this case, this man had a law degree. So the expert witness, Michael Mobbs, uh, this you know, would never make it into your average trial court. Um, he didn't witness the event, uh, he, so he's not an eyewitness. Um, He's not, yeah. He, what he did was he looked at some transcripts, and transcripts are basically somebody types up a report. So he looked at the report that the military put together saying that Hamdan, I'm sorry, that Hamdi uh, essentially had a weapon and that he pointed it uh, at uh, United States military personnel. The problem with all of this is that, according to the report, Hamdi wasn't arrested by U.S. military personnel. He was arrested by forces in Afghanistan that were part of the coalition and were Afghanistan. So I, you know, I want you to think about something, right? Have you ever been somewhere and people didn't like you? Uh, what if they suddenly had the ability to simply file a report saying that you pointed a gun at them? You know, they want to get back at you. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't like that you were there, that they didn't think you should be there. This is, we don't normally let this kind of evidence into court because it's called hearsay. Uh, the person wasn't there, they don't have any direct evidence, and so you're relying on gossip. And so hearsay gossip is basically the same thing. Um, so, you know, it's strange that this got this far, really, because this guy, mobs, um, it's really just being used here uh, to just get the case going. Um, so the, the district court says this is nonsense. Uh, the say-so of a person not connected to the criminal act can't be used as evidence to prove guilt. This is like textbook, criminal procedure, you, know, you can memorize this and hopefully you'll do well on your future exams. This hearsay is not admissible in the court of law. Uh, so this, the, this trial court goes a little bit beyond, but they're so irritated by this, you know, this is the evidence that the government is putting forward, that they order that the government and the military give, a, give them all of the documents to review. In other words, they're saying, we don't believe mobs. We think that mobs is committing perjury, uh, and that we want to review all the documents ourselves to see if there's any evidence whatsoever that Hamdi should be held. And they're saying that this is the, uh, the not to be able to do this, if the government doesn't produce these documents, then they've clearly violated constitutional law, common law, and other principles of law, international law, all sorts of issues going on. So it's surprising that the appellate court uh, decides to go against this, and they say, well, look, there have been a, a handful of cases, uh, less than five in the United States history, in which hearsay has been admissible, and so hold on trial court you can't just say that hearsay is never admissible 
sometimes hearsay can be admissible if national security is the issue. And they said, look, Hamdi was captured in a zone of active combat in a foreign theater of conflict. So this is called judicial deference. What they're saying is, we don't have enough evidence that Hamdi was not an enemy combatant. And so they're shifting the burden over to Hamdi to prove that he was not an enemy combatant. I don't know how you prove that you're not an enemy combatant if you're caught in Afghanistan. If I'm in Afghanistan at the wrong time. The only thing I can think of is there's this, this guy, Greg something, Mortensen, I think, uh, who wrote a book called Three Cups of Tea. And he was climbing in the mountains, the Himalayan mountains, and somehow he gets injured and he gets brought to the same part uh, of Afghanistan at the same time. So he becomes a National Times bestseller, right? Uh, and goes on Oprah and everything. Um, whereas Hamdi gets picked up and he's accused of being an enemy combatant. So how do you make sense of the two things? Well, one guy's a white American, the other guy's an Afghani American. And so that's the, you know, the, the benefit of the doubt went one way and then it didn't go the other way. But more importantly for a legal case, the lawyers really you know, didn't do a good job then in that first trial court because they didn't maintain the burden of proof. They let it slip. And so they should have been prepared to argue against these narrow cases. Their argument the hearsay was inadmissible was a good argument. It's a solid textbook argument. But they should have been prepared to say why that case was not like the other cases. Now, I wanted to make a note for criminal justice students that this is largely what happened after Terry versus Ohio that it shifts the burden onto the person who is in a high crime area. So in other words, it's, you can be reasonably suspected if you look a certain way in a high crime area uh, and you are not entitled to uh, the benefit of the doubt of constitutional protection. And so the court, you know, it's surprising they did this, but on the other hand, it's kind of consistent with another policy that they have. So now the Supreme Court, who's just reviewing, that's all, the only reviewing that the, what's happened so far, uses something called abductive reasoning. And I'll come to this a couple times, but it's more so in my legal system or judicial class, PLL 67, we, we look at this more concretely. Um, but this is all from page 12, and this is the, what's called checks and balances. So the rule here is that if Hamdi is correctly labeled, and again, this is the if, right? If Hamdi is correctly labeled, so she's saying, okay, Let's say the government is correct. And he's labeled this because he's in the theater of war and he's transferred to the soil of the US. Now we have a new question, right? Because he's a citizen, he must receive due process. So that's the rule. American citizens, when on American soil, must receive due process. So now we apply the rule. Hamdi now has legal counsel to challenge. You know, he's got lawyers, whether he is an enemy combatant and it has to go back to the trial court for now a fair hearing, meaning, meaning the standards have to be different. Now this is confusing, I'm sure, but level two, the appellate court was saying, if he is treated as an enemy combatant, and that means he doesn't have the rights of American citizen, he doesn't have to have due process. Painful you know, reality here, right? That, that is not the ideal you might hold. But that's what happens on the ground. That's what lawyers and judges have argued and have successfully argued, that if you are not an American citizen, this means if you're a legal permanent resident, you do not have the same rights as an American citizen. If you're an undocumented, you do not have the same rights as an American citizen. And so you don't necessarily have to get due process. Uh, this is an argument for if you can get American citizenship just so you have due process rights. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but that's one argument that you could think about. So the application here is saying, okay, he, he, whether he's an enemy combatant shouldn't come before the fact that he's a citizen. So he must get due process because he's a citizen, which means you have to go back and have the trial again. And now we have to see, should there be an exception to the hearsay exclusion rule for American citizens? That's a lot harder to argue, and that those cases that the, the state's government were referring to don't say that. They say somebody who is not an American citizen. Now, the reason is, if you're getting confused by this, is that if an American citizen goes to war against America, 
then they are they have the the they're going to be tried as they're going to be tried as um, treason under the treason laws and not something else and so you got to think about it that way now in conclusion here all citizens must be able to judge the label of criminal act in a court with neutral fact finders meaning a judge or a jury and that is part of due process that did not occur here and so that's what you kind of have to think about uh, in this situation Sorry about that. Okay, now that was the that was the the legally binding opinion. Uh, it's ordinarily called the majority opinion, but in this case it was a plurality, so it's called a plurality opinion, meaning it didn't have five judges. Uh, it had four judges. Uh, the others did something called a concurring opinion, which is very confusing, but they concur, they agree, so it makes it a majority. Uh, but they agree for different reasons. Um, the two judges, though, that dissent uh, out of the nine, so two to seven, um, it, the opinion is written by Scalia, and he was a very dramatic figure uh, when he was alive on the Supreme Court. And a lot of the judges now, um, Kavanaugh uh, in particular, Alito, they, Thomas, they actually really follow the same kind of principles that Scalia uh, follows. And this is called original intent. And so here are his objections, or here's what he thinks is wrong with the O'Connor opinion. Uh, and this represents really the political divide, I think, in this country pretty well. Um, now remember, this is not legally binding on lower courts. The so lower courts don't have to follow this opinion but they may use it as persuasive authority. So lawyers can argue this uh, dissent when they're arguing future cases, which means, you know, there are, now that we're using the phrase domestic terrorism, you know, imagine you get picked up uh, for owning a weapon or not owning a weapon, or I, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time in a high crime area, and there's been a domestic terror act. You could be detained uh, without a lawyer and without a trial uh, and without being told uh, what, what the charges were and the precedent here would be uh, the O'Connor um, case. So your lawyer would wanna argue the Scalia dissent here. Um, and this is his main phrase here is that, you know, this, this Anglo-Saxon system of separation of powers uh, has been created or exists simply to protect us from this kind of imprisonment. Uh, and he says, you know, look, even in the Constitution, this is the only common law uh, law or petition or writ that is actually listed in the Constitution. And then, you know, this idea that the executive, the president, that they can use the military on American soil against American citizens, citizens is, is crazy, right? And it, it, flies in the face of, of everything that we believe in the United States. Tell that to Trump, right? Uh, but I do not, he says, I do not think the statute even authorizes detention of a citizen. Uh, here is tough, right? Because it, with the clarity, and this means that the law is vague, and this is a, a reason why something should be unconstitutional, is that if the government acts in a way that is inconsistent with the words of the law, uh, then they shouldn't be able to get away with that. And this is called the interpretive canon um, about how statutes could be constructed. So what he's arguing is that he doesn't think that O'Connor followed the rules of rules for judges. I want you to remember that throughout this class, the rules of rules for judges. So this should be real. You should be saying, I need a break, take a break, uh, but come back and say, now what do judges do? Because you want to write this down because this is what we're going to be looking at uh, for most of the class because we want to think about how does this relate to the rest of society. Um, so here, look, judges are interpreters. And what are they interpreting? Conflicts within law. And so law is a big broad field uh, then has all these laws. 
and so the laws conflict with each other. So judges are brought in essentially to say what those laws mean, what was the intent of the legislature, and which one should be the one we follow. Kind of a strange job if you think about it. But rarely is positive law, Re rarely is a law written by a legislature, because you have to remember there's like, if it's a small legislature in a city or a state, it could be a hundred people who are arguing about what the law should be. And so, you know, it's not one person writing it, it's a hundred people writing it. And so it's not very clear and people are making compromises and it's not gonna apply in every future case. So judges are never gonna be 100% sure of what Congress meant or what they wanted from it. Um, and so O'Connor saw it, she saw the powers of the Supreme Court to be expanded. So judges had the powers to define not just the laws and not just the conflicts, but also the social context of the conflicts. And she says this is consistent with the checks and balances theory, you know, arguably that you should have learned about in, in your PO Will 51 class or in your American history class in, uh, in uh, high school. Scalia's, you know, using a different way of interpreting, sees it differently. She, he sees the powers of the court as limited and that they have to follow the rules of the rules of judges, which are called canons. And that separation of powers theory is different than checks and balances theory. Checks and balances theory is saying judges have to check con Congress and the executive and the military and police and, you know, all these different people. He's saying the d opposite of that is that the judges should not interfere with the other branches. And you'll have to decide, you know, I mean, they're both right. I mean, th they're both correct in that if we go to the textbook and look up checks and balances, or we go to separation of powers and look up check, you know, the, or the dictionary even, uh, they're both correct. So they're using these two theories against each other, uh, and neither one is really right. But Scalia adds this element of the historical context, and this is what, if you've ever heard the term living constitutionalist, this is what they don't do because they say, well, why would I apply 1780s logic to 2021? And again, they're both right and they're both wrong. You, there's no rule saying you can't look at the history and then there's no rule saying you must not look at the history. And so this is why Scalia believes there should be rules for judges and O'Connor believes that judges should be there to protect against the abuse uh, of power. And you'll have to decide which one you think uh, makes more sense as we go through all these cases in class. And both are legally persuasive. I mean, this isn't a moral question. I mean, it's a moral question, but lawyers aren't moral judges. They don't decide what the morals of a society should be. Uh, generally, some people believe they should. Um, and so, they, you know, these are good arguments. And so there's no, there's no way of knowing what the majority, what five judges out of nine, are going to believe based on these conflicts of law. And so that's why lawyers argue in court. So what does a legal scholar do? Well, I, you know, this picture is not a great picture, but you know, I, I was asked to do a, a talk on, you know, how, do the, how does environmental law at the international level prevent governments and corporations from polluting and things like that? And you know, I was on a panel with a, a lawyer from, from Ireland and you know, we both said the same thing. Two different countries, but we all live in the same world. Uh, not much. I mean, laws don't do much on their own. People have to do something with those laws. Uh, do those lead to more cooperation? Not usually because they normally conflict. And so what I do in my job, right, as a legal scholar, is to critically analyze the context, the patterns of language, and the construction of conflicts within communities, and then I present findings from these data. So, you know, I'm asked to look at this situation, and then I say, well, here's what I found out from studying it. And so that's somewhat similar to what you're being asked to do as a student, right? Uh, and that's kind of how this works. I mean, you know, this is the difference between um, a legal practitioner. They don't ask these questions. They don't think about these things. They don't write articles, right? Uh, they generally, you know, do what they're told. Um, here I'm critically analyzing the social context, so I'm putting it back within our, our everyday lives. And my work is focused in particular on these relationships and how they're formed 
out of what's called the constitutive identity of law, or how does the constitutional law help form our identities, or at least what we understand about each other, and how this acts out uh, as agency, your ability to make change in your own life, uh, and then the state or the government's ability to keep you from making those changes. So what do you do as a student of law? Well, largely your job here in this class is to start to look at these contradictions uh, between the ideals of, of law, what we would like law to do, uh, and what we'd like laws to be, uh, and then what really happens as it's implemented by real human beings, right? Laws aren't really a thing, human beings are. Uh, or another way of thinking about it, laws are words, uh, and so humans use words in lots of different ways. So here are the things that I think you should do in order to do well uh, as a, a student of law. You're going to begin with critical questions, but try to focus on how instead of why. Why usually has e easy answers. They're not good answers, but they're easy answers, right? Why did somebody do this? Well, because they're a jerk, right? Uh, that's not a great answer. How did they do it, right? That's a better answer. Well, they needed money, they needed support, they needed their friends to say so, things like that. That's what we want to look at. Then you need to do what's called a literature review, and you should do this partially based on your interests, and then whatever the sources that I'm providing for you. Um, but you want to do it with reliable sources, right? So th more and more, there's not very good sources uh, on the internet per se. Very few sources on Instagram or Facebook are reliable. Um, news media, I'm sorry to say, is not a reliable source uh, for the most part. They're, now it's, it's not, investigative journalism doesn't really exist anymore. It's mostly aggregate news, so it's, nothing's based on sources anymore. It's just people's opinions of opinions of opinions. Um, those opinions are great for other classes, but not for law classes, right? For law classes, we need the text, usually. You need to be looking at the laws themselves. And then secondary sources that help explain the laws, like things that I write uh, and other you know, colleagues like me and other people, those, those are helping you just understand the social context, not necessarily the, the law itself, right? So you have to try to read those things yourself and make up your own minds about what you think those things mean, but then you want to identify what's the interpretive pattern that you're using. Is it like Scalia? Is it like O'Connor? Is it like Thurgood Marshall? Right? There's a lot of different ways you can look at it. And then you want to think about all this in relationship to one another, you know, the cases, the decisions, the actions, the norms, the information that's available, including media, and why it's so biased towards, you know, opinion and think about what does that say about legal knowledge, right? How are people supposed to know what their rights are or know what's going to happen to them in a court of law if they're believing all this false information? You wanna think about that, right? This is the big problem of our time period. There's so much information out there, but most of it is nonsense. And so it's not really helping you when you get into trouble because lawyers aren't going to social media and quoting in you know Supreme Court to argue your case, right? They're using these legal rules and principles, and then they're going to apply them to scenarios and conflicts. And, and I'll go over a bunch of different uh, examples of this, but I've set up this little diagram if you want to take a screenshot or a picture just to help you kind of understand how this works, right? So left-hand side is I'm showing the contradictions in historical facts, and then as you move over, you'll start to see the pieces, right? This is what we mean by structure, and then all of this forms into the Constitution uh, or the law as you want to think about it. And this is just some easy examples, right? You could look at this from a bunch of different uh, points of view, but I know a lot of you are interested in police relations, and so I wanted to put that out there because we'll look at that a couple times. So finally, the key terms that you have to reflect and analyze, and this is just from, from this case alone, uh, is checks and balances as a judicial practice. So looking up the definition in a traditional textbook or a dictionary isn't helpful. Uh, what you need to understand is checks and balances as judges see it is something called judicial review. And we'll come back to that idea, but they're trying to, to be the, I, I say it this way, is they're trying to be the referee between the branches of government or the departments of government and the populations. Separation of powers is a judicial theory, right? So sometimes people think about it as a democratic theory, but it doesn't really apply unless you're bringing in the courts um, because I don't know how else you would think about separating those powers, right? The courts are the separators here. And then constitutional law, positive law, natural law, conflicts of law, and then really it, not memorizing what those things are, but understanding how are they different and why does that make a difference. 
Now, you should now be familiar with the writ of habeas corpus, but I need you to see that as a legal tool against illegal custody, detainment, and questioning, especially as we think about it uh, in future cases. And that combination of custody, detainment, and questioning is what we call arrest, right? So you're under arrest if you're in a car by a police officer. You're under arrest if a police officer stops you on the street, either touches you or you see their gun and their handcuffs and their uh, taser and all the baton and all those lovely toys they have, uh, and you don't feel like you can leave. That's an arrest. And so you need to have due process in that, in that experience. And the, the thing that protects that is this thing called the writ of habeas corpus. Now, again, that's the ideal versus what really happens. Now, these words vacate, remand, and rehearing, and, and bonk, vacate means that the decisions made at the lower courts are now vacated. They're gone. I'm getting rid of them. Remand means I'm sending them back. That's what happened in the Hamdi case. Is it got sent back to the lower court, and you're going to redo it with these rules that we've given you. Rehearing and bonk means the Supreme Court is sending it back to the appellate court, not the trial court, but they want the whole appellate court, right? So usually it's only three judges on an appellate court, but they want all of the judges available. So that could be 20, 40, you know, depends on the size of the appellate court. I think the Ninth Circuit in the West is the largest one. Then there's these words that you want to start to think about, standard of review, stare decisis, burden of proof, interpretive canons, original intent, contextualism, logical fallacy, and balancing. These are all things that come up in a case and when you have to interpret how to decide these cases as a judge, these are some of those concepts that you have to, to apply. Now, you're not going to get graded on whether you understand all of these concepts. I just want to introduce you to them uh, so that you understand these are the things that judges have to think about. And again, these were just pulled from one case here so far. And so there'll be more concepts that judges have to think about. And then now you should know the due process doctrine is about procedure on the one hand. That's what you largely learned in this case. Um, but there's also substance, which we'll get to more in future cases, which are their rights that are so fundamental that they're called inalienable, meaning they should never be taken away, meaning you should never have to use a negative right because the government should never be able to do this in the first place to you. So those are the kind of main things that I just want you to think about from that case. I know that was a lot of information um, and I'm sure that you'll have questions and so feel free uh, to come join me um, or in one of the Zoom meetings or uh, which are optional and voluntary I always have to say um, and then or just email me uh, or take advantage of the Google surveys that I'll give you and we can talk about these things. Again, I, I want you to focus on the big picture of this and think about what do judges do, what don't they do, what do lawyers do, understand the different sides, and then separate that and understand what's the difference then between what I'm doing as a professor, as a scholar, and then what you're being asked to do as a student. So we're not asking you to be all of those things. I just want you to understand that there are differences among how people look at cases. And hopefully that was clear.